Well, welcome everyone. This is Paul Bourne with the Pierce Conservation District. I want to welcome you to tonight's um, workshop. Um, I'll be talking to you uh, about the farm planning program at Pierce Conservation District. And we have Mike Poteet from the Pierce County Ag Program who will be talking with us about um, county guidelines, regulations, and code. Um, I want to thank you for all coming. If you would um, sign in the chat with the name you use to register online, that'll help us track who's here. Um, and um, I'll just get started here. I'm going to start off and then we'll have a little bit of time for a few questions and then Mike will give his presentation and we'll have some more time for um, questions. So let me start here from the beginning. Um, so you've all registered for growing your farm, how to develop your site. And we're going to um, start by talking about conservation districts. For those, might be a few of you who don't know about conservation districts, but we were born out of the Dust Bowl era back in the 1930s when poor farming practices um, led to massive erosion throughout the United States. The, the middle part of the, the breadbasket of the country and up into Canada. Um, so conservation districts were created to respond to this disaster to teach farmers um, better land management. So there are conservation districts serving almost every um, county in the United States. Um, here, in the United, here in Washington State, uh, we are, um, receive guidance from the Washington State Conservation Commission. We are a non-regulatory subdivision of state government, and we began here in Pierce County in 1949. Um, we provide free assistance with natural resource management. Um, we're led by a, a local board of supervisors and are focused on working within our community. On the west side of the Cascades, our primary focus is on water quality, but we have a number of programs through which we do that. Um, uh, we have our farm planning and ag assistance program. We have water quality monitoring and improvement projects, our habitat restoration program, environmental education, Harvest Pierce County and our community gardening. And we're also working to build climate resilience within Pierce County. Um, so our work with you, the, the public, is voluntary. It's not something that is required. It's something that you come to us and we just agree to work together in a cooperative manner. Really count on this um, cooperative approach. So the, the four main prongs of our farm planning and ag assistance program are promoting soil health, decreasing mud and erosion, uh, managing mud, managing manure and stall waste, and improving pasture growth. And all of these are designed to protect water quality. But at the same time, it's also there to improve your farm management, to improve your bottom line, and to improve environmental conditions on your property, which can also benefit your livestock and your crops. So um, soil health, you know, um, focusing on ways to improve pastures, our garden, our cropland, looking from to moving our land from something like this to something more robust through soil testing, uh, use of cover crops, and other um, management tools to create a healthy living soil ecosystem. Um, the other, one of our other focuses is mud management. This is not mud management. This is mud disaster. We want to go from something like this, find ways where we can work with you to find solutions such as heavy use areas, paddocks with appropriate footing to keep our livestock out of the mud. Hey, Paul. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but you, if you're showing your presentation, we can't see it. You need to share your screen. Oh, darn it. 
All right, we'll go back. I'm sorry. All right, hold on. Share my screen. I thought that was too easy. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So I go back there. Okay. See it now? Thank you. All right. All right. So it's a partnership, um, a volunteer. Um, these are the four prongs of our program that I discussed. Um, moving from poor soil conditions with poor growth of plants to something healthy through cover cropping, um, soil testing and amendments to build a healthy, healthy soil ecosystem. Um, mud management, moving from conditions that are unhealthy for our livestock and not fun to work in to conditions like this, where we're having heavy use areas with appropriate footing to keep our livestock out of the mud. Uh, improve our chore efficiency, improve our health of our livestock, and certainly make uh, manure management much easier. Um, this is a, a real life example of a friend who had purchased a property here in the, on the left, up in Maple Valley. She was able to, over the course of a few years, turn this muddy, confinement area into what you see here in the lower right. Um, that's what we're here to do is to kind of provide you, the landowner, the livestock owner with technical assistance and guidance on how to implement these best management practices. Uh, the other, one of the other prongs is manure management. Um, really becomes a major problem if we're not handling our manure properly and having a good disposal option disposal plan. Um, manure from animals becomes quite the problem if not dealt with on a daily basis. Horses can produ produce up to 50 pounds of manure a day. Um, we don't want to dump it off the side of the cliff is here in the lower right or, or on the lower left. We want to find some ways to store the manure in a bin of some sort so it can compost, become more stable as a soil amendment. We wanna keep it covered to uh, keep the nutrients from leaching out and to prevent pathogens and the nutrients as well from leaching into surface water or groundwater. So we really advocate the creation, construction of some sort of bin structure. Then once you have that manure, it's well composted, we really recommend that you get it out onto your fields. So you've paid for that manure. It's a good nutrient resource for your pasture. Um, pasture management is the other prong of our program. Um, we want to help you move from conditions like this conditions more like this in the lower right. You can kind of see the before and after. Again, this is a friend's property up in Maple Valley where she was able to really change the management of the previous landowners and turn it into something more beneficial for her animals and her management. And this, you know, this, this can be done. It just requires the proper tools, the proper management, and you can have your animals in a better situation with better forage. But these are our prongs of our program. These are what we work with with you as the landowner, the livestock owner. Um, we also provide uh, equipment, tools for rent. We have manure spreaders. We have a direct seed drill for renovating pasture. We have poultry equipment, poultry processing equipment. We have some temporary electric fencing that you can borrow. Um, we have a hay probe for testing your forage that you've bought or are going to buy for your animals. And all these can be um, accessed online. 
Um, so growing your farm, you know, that was, was kind of the topic of tonight. So when we think about that, you know, whether we have a property that's undeveloped just is in native vegetation, or if it's a property that we're wanting to expand um, our operation or we want to bring animals onto it, these are some of the things that we need to look at. Um, it's important to know um, what our zoning is in the county because this will affect um, livestock numbers, uh, it will affect setbacks from our property line, setbacks for structures, um, proper buffer widths from critical areas, whether those be wetlands or flood prone areas or high erosion areas. We want to consider what sort of livestock do we have, what side of livestock we want to bring onto the property, the numbers that uh, we want, but also the numbers our property can realistically support. Do you want to have crops? Are you interested in doing some sort of market share or CSA? You know, how are you going to manage your manure? How are you going to store your manure? How are you going to dispose of it? either on-site or, uh, or off-site. As we're thinking, as you think of expanding or bringing animals onto your property, it's important to know where's my well, where's my septic system, my tanks, my drain field, my reserve drain field. Uh, what sort of ag buildings are you considering? Um, do you need animal shelters? Uh, what will you do for heavy use areas? It's important for our area of the country, the Northwest, where it gets so wet for six months of the year that we have a place that our animals can be confined when our pastures are just too wet and our grass is not growing in the winter months. What about access roads? If we're gonna build a barn or create pasture in different sections of our property, how will we get our equipment to those pastures? How will you get your animals to those pastures? All right, a great resource is Pierce County Ag Program. Um, they have uh, a lot of information. You can just, I think you can just Google Pierce County Farm Program and Mike will also give us some links here. Uh, but a lot of good information. You can also, if you're interested uh, in particular in starting um, to sell produce or sell meat or eggs. Um, the Washington State Department of Agriculture also has a book, booklet that was written in 2019 uh, for small farms. So you can um, go to this link here in the bottom and download this as a PDF, I believe. All right, so what exactly, when I talk about farm planning, um, how do we proceed? First of all, you know, we're going to take a look um, at your property, take a, get a good aerial photo from the county's website, their GIS program. We're gonna come out, uh, meet with you, do a walk around of your property, see what your needs are, what your plans are, um, see what your site conditions are. Find out where you're, where you're located in the county. Also, we're very interested in your topography. You know, are you flat? Do you have low areas that might uh, pond water in the wintertime? Do you have a uh, slope, high slope that could erode if vegetation is removed, native vegetation is removed too severely? We try to get a lay of the land, so to speak. We're also interested in critical areas. You know, wetlands are often the ones that spring to mind. Um, this is the pull up the wetland layer on the county's GIS website. Um, you can see wetlands that have been confirmed, wetlands that have been tentatively confirmed, and then there's the potential for wetland review. So here on the left, kind of the orangey beige area is, I believe, unconfirmed or non-wetland, the pink is a confirmed wetland and the blue area is area of uh, potential wetland review where the county is going to want to know how to work with you on what you hope to do, what you plan to do and how that would affect 
the wetland and what sort of wetland buffer would be needed. Other critical areas, as I mentioned, are erosion areas, landslide areas, hydric soils, um, and a few other, other concerns. So, okay, well, you're thinking about um, bringing, in a, bringing a horse or a couple of goats onto your property. Um, you're gonna need some sort of structures to house your animals. You're gonna need some sort of structure to store your manure. Um, pasture areas, confinement areas. And where you locate these on your property um, depends on what is allowed in the code, what's allowed by zoning, but there are certain setbacks from the property line that you need to follow. No one likes to have a stinking pile of manure on their property line. So we want to be good neighbors. Um, so what's your existing layout? Possibly you have a property that's already um, been developed to a point, your home, your driveway, you've got your drain field, you have a reserve area, um, you have your well, uh, and Tacoma Pierce County Health Department likes, requires that a, a 100 foot radius circle, so 200 foot diameter, um, well sanitary area. And this sanitary area is to protect your water source, protect it from manure, um, chemicals, pathogens from your drain field. So it's very important to know where your drain, your drain field is, but where your well and sanitary area are located. If you don't know these things, a lot of times you can find out this information from uh, the health department. So what are things to consider? Say, you know, you want to bring some animals on. Um, so you've located these important areas. You know your well, you know your, your sanitary area, you know your drain field, your reserve. All right. What about, like I mentioned earlier, our topography? What is, since six months of our year is pretty wet, what's happening with the surface water? Um, where is it headed? Where is it ponding? Where does it leave your property? Does it leave your property? It's very important to know kind of what's happening on the land before you start uh, bringing animals onto it or expanding the number of animals you have. So what are some aspects of farm planning that we're going to discuss together? Um, like I mentioned earlier, okay, what, what sort of livestock numbers are really feasible for your property? You know, are you going to pasture them? Are you going to want most of their feed to come from your pasture? Are you going to mostly want a pasture area for exercise and you plan to feed them with hay and nutrients that you bring onto the property? Um, what sort of animal shelters do you want? Do you want a really nice barn with stalls or is some sort of just run-in shelter enough for you? Um, where will your heavy use areas be? Where will your, where will your barn be for your convenience. You know, here in this central area of this diagram, this green polygon, um, part of the east side of it, the polygon lies at the base of this hill. So maybe that's not the best place for your barn or your heavy use areas if surface water is coming down off the hillside and puddling there in the middle of the property. Um, to make sure your manure storage is, is high and dry, that your heavy use areas are high and dry. How are you going to manage the roof runoff from any structure you build or have? Um, what about pasture areas? Where are they located? How will you get equipment to them? How are you going to store your manure bin, your manure? Are you just going to do kind of a, a structure that you put together yourself, or do you want to have something constructed that's impervious to the rain and the wind and will, will really protect your manure from getting uh, saturated and leaching into the groundwater. Um, and then uh, do you have ponding? You know, uh, how does your water leave your property? Does it leave your property? So these are some of the things we're going to look at together 
and we'll address during the farm planning process. So the farm planning process is really, you know, a combined effort. You know, we have um, lots of information to share with you. We have uh, a number of um, tools at our disposal where we can help you manage your property or improve your management. But we really want to know what will work for you and what is realistic for you to be able to do. Um, so there's several of us at the, at the office. Uh, Nicole on the, on the left is um, the farm program specialist for the Puyallup River watershed and the White River wa watershed. Renee Skaggs is the farm team manager, the ag program manager. My area of uh, the county is the Key Peninsula, Gig Harbor and Islands watershed. And Allie Nichols is our crop farm specialist. So this is our contact information. We'd be happy to, to work with you uh, to develop your property in a proper in a way that's beneficial for you, beneficial for your animals, beneficial for the environment, and in line with county code. So that's all I have. Are there any questions that I could answer at this point? Our chat. So we have uh, someone in the chat asking what types of cover crops are used. Um, cover crops are often clovers. There are there's uh, rye. There's uh, uh, different kinds of peas, fava beans. Um, so oftentimes it's it's a grain or a grass some sort of pea or um, legume of some type, clover. I think Mike stepped away. He has a child he needs to attend to for a minute. Are most people on the call, do most of you already have livestock? Or is livestock uh, something new you're planning? So Katie's asking, is the well radius basically a dead space that can't be used at all? No, you can use it. You don't want any sort of accumulation of manure, or you don't want um, you don't want to have that be where your animals are confined in your heavy use area because that's a source of manure and urine. But some limited grazing during the grazing season is is allowable. You just don't want to turn it to you don't want to turn it into a muddy mess that's full of manure and urine. Okay, so the next question is, how do you determine how much water your well can output in order to expand your garden or orchard? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know how to. Um... I believe you can do a flow test and Allie in our office is versed in that. So maybe Georgia reach out directly to Allie Nichols and she can assist you with that. She's our crop farm specialist. And then uh, another question is, I need help on mud and manure management as well as creek protection. So Sarah, reach out to your, whoever is designated at our office in our farm team as covering your area. So like Paul said, he's Gig, Ar Gig Harbor, Key Peninsula, and Nicole is 
the Puyallup and White River watersheds, and I cover the Nisqually area. And if you have no idea then, you know, what watershed you're in, then definitely reach out to Paul after the workshop and we can figure out who best in our, in our team can assist you. And then, oh, Sarah says she's White River. Okay, so okay. Sarah, reach out to Nicole. And uh, is well space buffer impacted by the depth of the well? That's, a, that's a, something really important to consider. Um, I'm probably be best to check the uh, Tacoma Pierce County Health Department um, domestic well um, guidelines. They have a, a handbook on that. Um, I can help you with that offline at some point, direct you to that. Okay, so that was Wendy. So I'm going to make a note, Wendy, that we're going to reach back out to you on this one. But I, I so I uh, was working with a landowner who ended up putting, uh, had a new well put in and also was putting in um, a little uh, heavy use area for their animals and um, put it rather, put it pretty close within the 100 foot radius circle. So my concern for her was that, you know, depending on how deep that well is, it could be a real problem. You could be just polluting your own well. Um, and then the last question we have, Paul, before we go over to Mike, and then of course, everyone feel free to stay on and ask questions at the end. And also you don't have to necessarily put them in the chat. You can unmute yourself and ask at any time. But Katie's asking pretty, pretty in-depth question. How do we determine the number of livestock and how often to rotate the pastures? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have spreadsheets um, that we use that have been developed um, from the Natural Resources Conservation Service that help us, you know, uh, determine, you know, the number of animals you have, what, can, what is your soil type, what is the productivity of that soil type, how is it managed. Um, these spreadsheets then kind of generate um, you know, the expected forage uh, on any given month. Um, so that can kind of help determine um, how much you, how much of the feed will be provided by the forage. Um, and then you use the, you use the height of your grass as the basic um, determination, determining factor of when to rotate. You know, uh, the guidance is that you never want to graze your grass below three inches, three to four inches all of the growing points, all the renewal points for the grass are within that first three inches. If you allow your animals to graze below that three inches, they're gonna chew off the growing points and it'll take your grass, your forage much longer time to regenerate. Um, so you start at six or eight inches when your grass is nice and healthy, you let your animals graze down no lower than three inches and then you move them on to another section of your property where they can start again at six to eight inches usually. But we have spreadsheets that, you know, that we work with that kind of help us determine what might be possible. And a lot depends on your management, you know, what sort of time you have to move your animals. Are you fertilizing? You know, are you able to irrigate sometimes on certain areas of the pasture? Um, Well, we thought it would be very helpful tonight if, if Mike Poteet, who's the Ag Planner for Pierce County, would um, come and talk to us about um, some of the details involved with um, growing our farm when that means some sort of construction or movement of dirt or, um, you know, wanting to know, you know, how many animals are allowed. So I'll turn it over to Mike and... You can take it away. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thanks to Pierce Conservation District for uh, allowing me to help out this evening. Um, it's nice to be able to get some information out from the perspective of the, the county's planning department. So um, as Paul said, my name is Mike Poteet. I work for Pierce County Planning and Public Works. I work in the planning office as um, 
uh, I'm technically a planner, although I do a lot of other things besides just, um, I, I don't review projects, but I help, uh, I help residents in agricultural and, and rural landowning situations uh, navigate some of the permitting process, uh, answer questions, initial inquiries, try to help people get the ball rolling on projects so that the, the amount of, of frustration is limited as much as possible. Um, I try to get answers for projects that are in development um, while they're going through that process so that once applications are made, submissions are made to the county for review and approval, that hopefully I've helped you get all your information together, answer all the questions up front so we don't get into this um, back and forth process of submission, resubmission, resubmission, uh, because this was missing or this was incomplete or um, you know the, the code was interpreted incorrectly. So I try to be a liaison to folks that have to work with the county planning office. Um, so I'm going to, to go through some slides this evening that are really, really heavy on links. And I've done that for a reason. I'm not going to go clicking through every link that I put into this presentation, but I do have this presentation as a PDF uh, that we can share with everybody after this session. So we wanna make sure that Paul and Renee have everybody's uh, email information and that way we can send out a copy of these slides. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through it with you and I'm gonna describe a little bit of what's on each slide, but I just want you to realize there's so much <laughs> involved with, with getting through the, a permitting process with the county. And so my job is to try to boil it down a little bit and uh, hopefully make it less challenging. And I'm just gonna apologize up front. If I have to run away for a minute, um, I'm the only one home with a three and a six year old and they're in bed after a time change. So they don't always go right to bed. Um, so anyway, I apologize for that in advance. Hopefully it doesn't interrupt me. So with that, I will share my screen so you can see the slides. I'll begin. So hopefully everybody can see this as it is right now. Okay, so here we go. Um, design and permitting requirements. So what's it gonna be like to work with us? Great question. So no matter what you do out on your farm or on your land, as soon as you start breaking ground, uh, clearing something, grading something, expanding something, you know, knocking down trees so you can build a road, digging a footer, you know, whatever it might be, you're now entering the wonderful world of permits. Um, and so you want to be mindful of uh, if you're doing anything significant to um, disturb the surface, which is going to potentially alter drainage patterns, that's really where you start to cross that threshold of, okay, now I need to approach the county to find out if what I'm doing is okay. So that's before you ever put in a building, something with a roof, you know, um, installing some sort of subsurface drainage, introducing an impervious surface, any of that stuff, that is all secondary to actually breaking the ground. And so it's important that, uh, that everybody keeps that in mind when they're gonna start a new project. So there are resources. Um, obviously you're here at a sponsored workshop by the Conservation District and Paul's been through some of the things that they can help landowners um, work through with the county at the county level. Um, I'm in place at Planning and Public Works. I have another person who is half-time support, but doesn't really work on the ag permitting stuff as much. Um, I do, however, convene a team of specialists from each of the different reviewing divisions. So that's resource management, which is all of our critical areas, uh, criteria and assessments, um, development engineering, which is all of our grading, clearing, impervious services, all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, planning broadly, even though I'm a planner, I have a, a, a current planner who um, provides a little bit more in-depth knowledge of county code than what I, I have personally. Um, I've got somebody from 
Fire Protection Services. I've got a couple of people from the health department, including food safety if you're doing agritourism stuff, or uh, I've got somebody from the septic side that will step in and help. Um, I'm trying to think, who am I forgetting here? Uh, oh, building. <laughs> Of course, building. Uh, so I've got a plans examiner who, who helps uh, me do some preliminary reviews of projects and base plans and things that people might wanna do beyond just clearing some ground. Um, it's a really nice group to have because what I can do is take projects from, uh, or, or potential projects from landowners and bounce it around to this team outside of a formal review process. There don't have to be developed site plans or anything like that, but I can get some early feedback for customers and help you get to a better place so that whenever you do submit for final review, we've, we've hopefully short circuited or shortcut all of those potential, you know, incorrect components or, or resubmittals. So uh, it's, it's a nice, group to have at my at my disposal as, as I need them. So how do you want to engage with us? Uh, well, the first thing you want to do is you want to start at our at our homepage, at the development center, and you really, really want to do your homework. I cannot stress this enough. Doing your homework on your parcel and what you want to accomplish will take, you know, the first 25% of the work and really make it a whole lot easier. So you want to um, you want to learn more about your property. You can do that through the county's website and some of our interactive tools. Um, you want to look at things through the auditor's office. You want to you want to figure out if there's any um, historical recorded documents about you know maybe your part of your piece of land was part of a short plat and there's restrictions from 1982 that you don't even know about because when you bought your property, it wasn't something that, you know, was uh, divulged to you by the realtor. Like there's just so many things that are hidden in these old documents. So you really wanna do extensive homework on your property, learn about things like critical areas and buffers and your zoning. You know, you, you wanna do all of those things right up front. And, we, and I can help you do those things as well. I'm happy to help with some of that. Um, you may figure out pretty quickly that you're going to need more help to, to uh, design and engineer some of your projects. If you're wanting to build something, obviously you're gonna need uh, engineers for that. If you need survey work done, um, if you're gonna need wetland verifications, uh, you know, the county provides some uh, critical area services for, uh, for residents, but some things we don't provide. So, um, this is just all about understanding what we offer and what we're gonna require. Um, and every one of these things that I've got linked on here is gonna take you to a different page and it's gonna tell you things about um, what you're gonna need to consider. Customer information meetings are a really valuable tool. Uh, we recommend them about 50% of the time to different projects. Um, it really, what it does is it basically takes all of those different disciplines that I go to to help me do some preliminary review and it gets them into one room at the same time and it lets you present your concept and then take feedback. Um, and so I can get you part of the way to where you wanna go, but sometimes that customer information meeting is more useful than just having me as a conduit between five different review staff. Sometimes it's better to just get all of them together with you in one room, well, virtual room, right now, but hopefully one room soon, um, and let you just pepper them with questions and be prepared to take a lot of notes because usually um, our staff is well prepared for these things and they will bring you a lot of information to these meetings. Um, and then of course, there's always a conservation district. If you're working with Paul or Renee or Nicole or Allie or any of them, I work with them too. And so they always know how to get a hold of me and, and talk about a project for people. So what's the prop permitting process look like? Well, we try not to make it look so much like that anymore. Uh, we, we do a lot of things paperless now. Uh, everything can be done online at this point. You can go in person to our development center once it reopens. Uh, it's been closed now for 12 months exactly. Um, so 
We hope to have it open again within the next two to three months. We're crossing our fingers for that. But in the meantime, everything is done online. Um, you can get a hold of people uh, by phone or through Zoom type meetings uh, without too much trouble. And um, once you apply for a permit, you can track everything online too, and you can sign up for regular updates as to what the status of your project is. Okay. So how complicated can it be? Well, it's always site dependent. Like I said, you wanna conduct your own research. It can be as simple as a, just one application and a site plan in some instances, uh, which I'll get through in just a second. But it can also be as complicated as, you know, getting a building permit, getting a site development permit, going through um, the joint application for, um, through fish and wildlife at the state level, which also then can go to the Army Corps of Engineers if you're messing with something near a waterway. You might have shorelines that you're dealing with. Um, you, might, uh, you might cross a threshold and need a SEPA <laughs> uh, evaluation. You could need uh, a wetland review and perhaps you need a variance, which then puts you in front of a hearing examiner. It just, things can really snowball quickly. And so that's why you really, really want to do parcel research early on because, and, and this also goes for if you're looking at a new piece of property, really do extensive research because there's nothing worse than buying a piece of property and finding out six months after you buy it that all the things you thought you were going to be able to do there, you know, you're hemmed in by all these different regulations and you're going to have to pay $20,000 just to even start your project. Like that. That is a really terrible thing to have to break to people, and it does happen. So um, it's it's good to know as much as you can because there are, sometimes there are exemptions in place. So I just I cannot stress enough about early research. So let's get into it a little bit. So all projects are going to require a site plan, no matter what you're wanting to do, even if it's just you know dig a dig a five. 100 square foot heavy use area, you're going to have to put in a site plan for that um, and a master application. It doesn't have to be very complex. It can be quite simple, but as soon as you start manipulating the surface of the earth, we're going to want to see a site plan. We're going to make sure you're taking all those things into consideration that Paul went through on setbacks and buffers and, um, you know, are, are you zoned for this? Uh, you know, th that all matters to us. Are you protecting your wellhead? Um, and we, we just recently, we've redone our web page. And so when you go to the site plan website, we actually have a lot more assistance here than we did even just five or six months ago. But it'll, we have a new tutorial um, that's been posted by the head of our um, development center staff uh, that shows you how to, you know, create a scale, how you want to lay out your site plan, what are the requirements going to be? And so there's some really nice information on this page to help people do a site plan without having to go to an engineer to get one done. Now, more complicated projects are gonna require uh, more professional services assistance, but um, we hope to make simple projects simple enough where you don't have to bring in or, or pay an outside consultant to do these things. So lots of projects that are going to require the use of the county stormwater manual. And I'll get to a little bit more of that soon, but that's when you start getting into some more complicated things. But again, nothing that you can't do on your own to a limit. And I'll, I'll get into that in just a moment. So here's a really generic kind of concept of what a site plan might look like. This was done with engineering software. You don't have to do that. You can do these things hand drawn, it's fine. But I like it because it's simplistic and it shows um, pretty clearly. Okay, so you've got your existing building. You want to show where that is. You want to show the distance between all the buildings. That's very important for setbacks within a parcel from other buildings because that gets into things like fire code. <laughs> so you really, we always want to see what the distances are. It shows all the distances to property boundaries of every building. It shows the setbacks with this dashed line all the way around. So you can see that everything's within the setback. It shows where all the paths are. It shows 
existing impervious surfaces and then where the proposed structure goes. So um, there's a, a utility easement shown here. The only thing I don't see on this one that I wish it had would be that well and the wellhead protection area. But um, again, we have tools to help you make a site plan, but there are certain key elements that, um, that if you don't put into your site plan, it's gonna get kicked back to you immediately and you're gonna to have to start back over. So that's why it's so important to use the resources online that we make available. So you wanna consider your setbacks. Uh, animal enclosures, different types of animal enclosures have different types of setback requirements. Um, farm stands can require different types of setbacks and access um, allowances, uh, fences and retaining walls, all of those things uh, can be impacted by setback regulations. Um, buffers, now buffers apply in lots of places, but generally wetlands, fish and wildlife, um, some aquifer recharge areas, wellhead protection is an issue, uh, fish bearing streams. If you're wanting to do something on what's called a, a F1 stream type, which means it has fish in it for some part of the year, um, then there is a buffer for that. If, if it's an N1 stream, that means it doesn't have fish, but it is a tributary, a direct tributary to a fish bearing stream. So that has a buffer off of it. Um, and so sometimes you might need uh, a stream type verification in those instances. There's a lot of things that can happen out there. And I just grabbed this snapshot um, that shows Okay, so you've got a fish bearing stream. So it says type F1 or F2 water. And then there's a 150 foot water body buffer because it's fish bearing. If it's, if it's an N1, then it's 115 foot. So still pretty significant. But here you've also got a regulated wetland that's been mapped and delineated and identified as a, a critical area to protect. Well, that has its own buffer. And so now here's another 50 foot buffer off of that. And so your buffer doesn't just run parallel to your stream, but it has to account for any other included critical areas within the buffer that it currently, or that is off of the waterway. So this can get really complicated when you pull up um, your parcel on the county's GIS and you might see your entire property might have these blue bubbles on it, which, says your possible wetlands, that is oftentimes because it's part of these buffers, okay? And so that's when we have to get county staff out there to do a verification. Sometimes we can do verifications uh, from our desks, but sometimes we do have to get out on the site. So buffers and setbacks, hugely important. And again, everything in here that has a link is, is a resource for you to be able to go and, and learn more about each of these considerations. So stormwater design and site development requirements. This is where things get really in depth and that's why this, uh, this workshop is you know, how to develop, you know, growing your farm, how to develop your site because so many projects out there for folks that are uh, just grazing livestock or have small farm operations, even the little things like manure bins or heavy use areas, those, even if you're not building something and need a building permit, you typically will need a site development permit. And so that's why this is in here. Um, it's a hugely complicated volume, 1500 pages, you know, but for most projects, there's just a few chapters that you can focus in on. If you were doing large scale, you know, housing developments, then yeah, you'd need all six volumes and you'd need all 1500 pages, but not for the kinds of things that most people are trying to do in, in rural land settings. So there's a, there's a couple of charts within the site development manual that help you figure out what you're gonna need to do, okay? Um, if you've got new development, there's a chart, and if you've got uh, redevelopment, so you're repairing something, fixing something, modifying something, they have their own flow charts, but the important things to remember here are if you're, in, if you're replacing or introducing 2,000 square feet or less of new or redeveloped hard or impervious surface area, then you have a very simple 
path forward, and it's called the basic abbreviated plan. If you have more than 2,000 square feet, then you get into what's called the advanced abbreviated plan. And if you go any further than that, um, you know, if you're over 5,000 square feet and you're, you're doing some really major work, then you're, you're talking, there's no abbreviated plan. <laughs> you're, in a, you're in a full site development plan at that point. But most of these projects are you know, less than 5,000 feet. There is one other criteria there. If you're not introducing impervious surface, but you're disturbing land up to 7,000 square feet, then you can still get these abbreviated plans. Um, and that's really where you wanna try to be. I always tell people, if you can keep yourself under 2,000 square feet of impervious surface being introduced, that's really where you wanna be because those are the easiest plans for just everyday people like me or you to put together. Um, I'm not an engineer, so, you know, I wouldn't tell you something that wasn't possible to do. So there are 10 minimum requirements in the site development manual. And I, you've heard me use the phrase basic and advanced abbreviated plans already. A basic plan means you only have to meet two of the requirements. That's awesome. An advanced plan means you have to meet five of them. It's a little more work and you might have to hire somebody to come in and do um, stormwater uh, pollution prevention plan for you. Um, if you are under 2,000 square feet and you're doing a basic plan, you basically get to write the story of what you're doing and you get to, you get to say how you're addressing what are called the 13 elements, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. If you get into a really big project and you're trying to do something large scale, which some of our farm operations do want to do, you get into a whole bunch of other stuff about off-site um, impacts and, and what you're going to need to do. You get into financial liability and you have to put together an entire operation and maintenance plan for, you know, post-installation. It's, it's much more involved. But for most people in this session, I'm guessing you could do anything that you want to do with your farm setup with a basic abbreviated plan, which is where I would try to help you get. So there are 13 elements. Uh, in the basic construction, stormwater pollution prevention, that's what SWPP stands for. And all this stuff right here, not even every project has to address these 13 elements because it might not be relevant to your project. But these are the 13 elements right here. Um, I've gone through the new impervious surfaces. There is one specific place in that entire stormwater manual, 1500 pages. You can boil it down to about 15 pages that describe BMPs for each one of these elements. So it basically gives you all the information you need, you would need to address as you describe your project to get a site development permit. Now the advanced plan, you're talking soils reports. Well, that's paying for a consultant to come out. Maintenance covenant. Now you're talking about, you know, what is the long-term responsibility of this new development that's taking place. Um, a full construction, there's an added P right here. Now this is a stormwater pollution prevention plan. So now you're actually having to put together a, a maintenance and well, a construction, a maintenance and a monitoring plan. Whereas under the basic, you're just describing how you're going to address the 13 elements during the construction process. Okay, so other relevant information. An agricultural structure under 600 square feet can be constructed without building permits. It does require a notarized affidavit and a site plan, and it still will, will require a site development permit in almost every instance, and there will be the need to review for any impacts to critical areas. Um, Fire is not going to be an issue in that situation, and unless you're running water to it from a well, the health department doesn't care about it. Um, we do have a fee schedule that is important for you to think about. Like I mentioned, say you 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 end up needing a variance because you want to stick something uh, a little bit too close to a critical area, and you think that's your only way to do it, and then you go look at the fee schedule and find out that's going to cost you an extra $4,000 just to try to get that done, you might change your mind. You might want to rethink your design. So consulting the fee schedule is an important part of planning out your project. Um, 
ag structures over 600 square feet are generally covered under single family residential permits. I know that's a weird place for it to fall, but that's just the way that the county is set up right now. Um, a new business venture may be subject to traffic impact fees. That's something that people don't tell you about, but they can be really expensive. So that's something else that has to be considered. Um, lots of ag structures are exempt from fire protection, uh, fees and permits, but you still want to monitor that. If you put them too close to another structure, then you're not gonna get that fire protection um, exemption. But if, if you do your setbacks, properly and you keep your square footed down generally for ag structures fire protection fees and, and permits are waived driveway approaches is something else that will end up in your site plan if you're getting a new access point those require permit they're part of the site development permitting process um, signs signs require permits anything septic or or well related and that could be a domestic well an irrigation well or if you're feeling really crazy and you wanna to try to start a big business and bring the public out, if you wanna get a public, uh, public water system, that well would also be regulated through the health department. Um, emergency vehicle access, that is something that is very important to the fire protection services team. And so any new project or any new development, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you, you, you put into your site plan wide enough um, egress and ingress for those EVAs. And then lastly, this isn't real common, but it does come up from time to time, accessory structures and ADUs. A lot of the things that, that small landowners, small rural landowners especially uh, are wanting to do might fall under accessory structures. And those are great ways to get through some of the permitting process. And if you wanna put, um, you know, say you're, Say you're running horse stables and you want to put up one of your workers uh, with some worker housing, you could consider accessory dwelling units, which is a, a really interesting way to go about possible worker housing. Um, this is a lot of stuff, and I know it is. That's why I put all these links in here because I want you to be able to use this file and this presentation as a way to go and access information quickly. It's not fully comprehensive. But everything I've linked to in here, you know, this is going to cover 80 to 90 percent of the things that you might encounter as you're trying to get a permit with the county. Um, and of course, I'm available. We have what we call um, uh, permit technicians through the Pierce County Development Center, uh, who you can reach out to with a phone call or online chat. Uh, at any time and ask questions of. Um, they're going to be able to help walk you through some of these things just like I can. Um, and they're probably a little more responsive than I am just because I, I have a lot of other responsibilities, but their responsibility is solely to help people get through the permitting process. So hopefully this is helpful for everyone. I'm happy to take some questions. Like I said, I will send this, uh, I think I've already shared the PDF version of this presentation with Paul, and uh, I'm happy to have him share this with anybody on the call or anybody else that asks, um, because I think that it is incredibly important that you have as many tools as you can get at your fingertips. So thank you for listening, and I apologize for having such a boring presentation compared to Paul's awesome pictures uh, that show you the fun part of farming. So with that, I'll take any questions and you don't have to put them in the chat. You can put them, you can just turn off your microphone and ask me questions if you want to. So uh, Katie's asking, does she need a permit for a fence? I'm assuming that means livestock fence. Yes. Yes, some some fences do require permits and I will slap up something in the chat that gives you a little bit um, of detail in that. So I'll pull that up and put it in the chat while um, we field any other questions, of course. So to the Wainwrights, yes, we're going to put uh, we're going to send you this PDF of the presentations and the, the video from tonight's workshop, the recording will put, be put up on our website. I 
I think you bombed everybody out, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot, you know, it, it, working with the county is a lot. And, and I know it is. Um, I, I never worked for the, I started working for the county a year and a half ago and um, I had, you know, I never worked in a, in a county or any kind of government position. And I was, um, I was pretty astonished. I, I mean, it's just so much and it's so daunting. Um, I, I can't imagine trying to go through a permitting process without somebody to help me do it. Uh, so I try to be as, um, as helpful as I can. But again, it's, uh, it, it's just so much. There, there's so much about it. Um, I'm going to put some things, you know, when it comes to fences, there's a lot of different stuff you can get into. Um, let's see. There's and, just so uh, many, there's so many places. That Sarah's wondering, do, we, do they need a permit for manure storage? You don't need a permit for manure storage, but you have to be careful to make sure you're not in any regulated floodways. Um, if you're in a regulated floodway, then there are maximum quantities of manure that can be stored. Um, if you're not in a regulated floodway, then you don't need a permit for it. You just have to make sure that you're not doing it um, within certain proximity to your neighbors. There are setbacks associated with that. And what about a structure for manure storage, Mike? Yes, if if it's over, well, if it's over 600 square feet, then you'll need a building permit. If you need, um, if you don't need a building permit, you probably will still need a site development permit because most of those structures are going to have um, some sort of impervious footing. Uh, you're going to have a foundation generally, but you also are a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are going to have uh, what I would term like a runway, you know, for you to bring your tractor up into and scoop in and scoop out. Uh, you don't want to turn that into mud. So you'd probably have a hard, um, a hard surface underneath the lead up. So even if you had a 400 square foot manure bin, you probably have an additional two to 300 square foot pad outside of that. Um, that would be the impervious service and would require the site development permit. Okay, so next question is, who would someone consult about large animals that have died as far as burial on your property or where do you take them or, you know, what, what are the regulations on that? That is a great question and I do not know the answer to that. I am, <laughs> I'm not going to pretend I know the answer to that one. I apologize. I will, if this will be recorded and we'll have that question. And I will uh, <laughs> do my best on that one. I think it uh, has to do, I mean, I'm going to let you look this up, Mike, but I'm, I believe it has to do with your proximity to surface water if you're going to do home burial. There is the option of composting dead animals too. Yeah, and I know that some livestock farmers do compost their dead animals. Um, I, I'm trying to think who it was that told me that Dairies do it a lot. Yeah, dairies do it a lot. But I was just talking to one of our local farmers, and they they had a dead. It's either a dead goat or a dead sheep. I think it was a sheep, and they they put the carcass into their existing compost pile, and it was gone within like three weeks, <laughs> and there was no smell or anything. So I and we don't regulate that. I mean, as long as your compost is controlled and not stinking out, you know, your neighbors, then we don't care. So, um, so using, utilizing a compost storage or a manure storage type facility to do that um, is, is a great way <laughs> to not have to deal with, with a carcass. Um, right. So we're going to get back to Sarah and everybody else on, you know, other alternatives on your own property or otherwise. Let's see. So the problem with the fencing question, and I'm not trying to like put it off or anything, but the, the problem with the fencing question is there is fencing code all over the place uh, within county code. And that's why I'm kind of like stalling on what sort of answer to give you because 
there are places where we get into a lot of specificity on fences and there's other places where um you know we it just is kind of mentioned in passing as to you know don't don't put a fence in a place but there's there's fence requirements for buffers around wetlands there's fencing requirements in residential settings there's fencing requirements when it comes to setbacks so not buffers um and that's why it's a really hard question to say do you need a permit um it depends Maybe, on the, it depends on the use basically right can you get get give us some specifics katie Yeah, I was just, um, we haven't developed any of the land yet, but I was wondering if I could start putting up any type of perimeter fence. Yeah, it, um, so it does depend a little bit on where you are in the county. Some, this is, this is why it keeps getting complicated, I apologize. Um, we have what are called community plans for different parts of the county and they all have slightly different guidelines and um, design standards. Generally with things like fencing, they're not too extreme. If it's your property, you, you can usually put up a fence. It generally has more to do with height. Like we don't want people putting up 10 foot fences. You know, if you want to put up like four foot fences that are not on top of a retaining wall, then generally you can put your fence up. But as soon as you start putting things that get uh, above a certain level of height, that's when we start to, to put more cons uh, restrictions on. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, I was just thinking like four or five feet, nothing. Yeah. They just, yeah. You know, field fence, you know, woven wire, barbed wire, four exactly. or five feet high, like as long as you're not blocking uh, visible sight lines, that's really where we start to get a little pickier. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Here's a good planning question for you, Mike. So um, if someone has many projects that they want to do in the future, would they submit the site plan that has everything they want to do or <laughs> can they add changes and submit every time they want to start a new project? So that's a great question. And I, I have this conversation with people pretty regularly. So you have to balance this one. I think this one came from Sarah, is that right? Yeah, so Sarah, you really wanna think about this. If, if you've got multiple things that you wanna do out there, but you already kind of expect to do them in stages, um, what I suggest you do, even though it's a little more costly, it's actually less work, is to, to bite them off in chunks under 2000 square feet of impervious surface. It really is so much simpler that way. You know it's good for you to develop the larger plan and know what you want to do but when it comes time to get permits to do the projects i think it really behooves people to do it as simple as you can um, because it's going to make it's going to make your permitting experience way simpler i can take somebody's project that is a basic abbreviated plan so less than 2,000 square feet new impervious surface maybe a building maybe not but you know if there's no critical areas out there or if it's a, a very simple verification that you're not interfering with critical areas um, those kinds of projects if i do my job i can get you through the permitting door you know when that application comes in we can have you approved within three to four weeks which is pretty quick in the permitting world whenever you start introducing you know, different stormwater prevention, uh, pollution prevention plans and soils reports and all these things, then everybody's going through things with a finer tooth comb and there's more potential to get out, you know, redline this, send it back to the customer, resubmittal. Every time you do those resubmittals, it adds a week or two to your project. And you're so much more likely to get pegged uh, with a red line on something in your plan even if you're using a consultant, I see this happen all the time with people who are paying consultants thousands of dollars to do this stuff for them. And they're still getting projects redlined, even though they're supposed to be the experts of this. So if you, if you can keep it simple and you can do it in you know three or four stages over the course of three or four years, yes, it's gonna take more time. 
it's going to spend a little bit more money just on the applications, you know, getting the each of the permits, but it is going to be way simpler for you to get through the process. You bet. Trying to see if I missed anything here in the chat. Let's see here. I want to, I do want to put something in the chat about fencing. I just want to put something as helpful as I can to get you to where you need to go. Matter of fact, um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen really quick. Um, yeah, I'm going to take a last call for questions. Just, I'm going to share my screen one more time because I want people to see the, the complications of, with fencing. I, I think that was a really good question and I don't want to shortchange anybody about the answer for that. So um, hopefully this will pop up in just a second. Okay, so where I'm at right now is um, I'm in Pierce County code and there are ways to go through and search for things in the code. And you know, I don't expect anybody to take the time to go do much of this, but when you search for fencing, there are 47 different places in county code that talk about fences. In one section, there's 65 different places. <laughs> in another, there's 32, 25, 15. And, and you see, here's Gig Harbor Community Plan area. And if I go into the next 10 of these, uh, here's the Graham Community Plan, Fredrickson Community Plan. So fencing comes up all over the place. And so if you have a really specific need with fencing, the best thing to do is just send me a question. Um, I think that it's a lot easier to answer specific um, issues than it is to get into this nightmare of, of um, well, how many places is there fencing? Well, here's stuff about side, side obscuring fences. And let's see where it takes me next takes me to um, fencing standards on infill compatibility. Like nobody here cares about that. But, um, you know, temporary construction fencing is another thing. And so whenever you're doing this stuff, um, you know, there are even regulations on construction fencing. Uh, it just, it goes on and on and on. Outdoor storage area screening standards, landscape type one fencing. So anyway. I wanted to show that really quickly so you could understand why it's hard for me to just drop a link in to help answer fencing questions. Um, if you have fencing issues, the best thing you can do is just uh, get in touch with, with me or somebody at the development center that they can navigate all this stuff to. So I'll take, I guess, you know, it's 8.15. We've got, we're scheduled for up to 15 more minutes, but it seems like um, we've answered most of the questions out of the chat, so um, probably should open it back up for any questions to Paul or to me or Renee, or if anybody has questions for each other, if you know each other and you want to ask questions, <laughs> however you want to do it. I guess so I'll, I'll pop in for another question then about, so if I'm... Um, going to create some pasture on my property that was previously treed that's a permit issue or how does that work depends on how heavily treated is katie um if, if you're talking about really clearing off um i think the threshold's 2500 board feet um, i'd have to check with our forestry specialist on that but there is a threshold that you cross for clearing uh 
clearing land, clearing forest land and conversion. Um, now it's not disallowed, it's just, it is regulated. Um, and so, so that's a consideration. If you're just cutting down, you know, a, a small number of trees and it's part of a pasture management plan, that's not necessarily getting into permit world. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. This has been really helpful, Michael. And um, you know, people can always reach us by email if a question pops up later. Yeah, and I, you know, I have a lot of responsibilities, and so, like I said, I, I might not be the fastest person to check with, but uh, I get back to everybody, and I will help anybody answer questions. Um, you know, I'll spend five hours a day on a project just to try to get you some answers if I have to. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out to me. That's part of my role. I'm not, I'm not the, the regular county planner. I don't just, um, you know, I can go out and do site visits and look at stuff with people. Uh, I do have a farm background. And so I'm happy to try to, to hear what you need to do and what you want to do and find ways to help you through it with the county. Um, I'm more of a liaison to, to the community uh, and, and trying to meet needs than I am somebody that sits down and review, reviews your projects and you know marks what's wrong with it. That's not really my job. So I'm happy to help out. Okay. Well, I really appreciate it, Michael. This is a, I've, I've learned a lot tonight. So um, appreciate you taking the time. Is there anything else we want to add, Renee? Nope. I think um, just really thankful everyone is here and trying to learn what they need to do or what to consider. Um, you know, we really want people to know these things on the front end instead of trying to dig them out of a hole later. But that's what, you know, the conservation districts are here to help folks if they are under some regulatory issues. So, you know, if that's you also, then then definitely reach out to us and we can work through Mike to try to remedy your situation. Yeah, last thing I just wanna say once again, know your parcel, know your land. It's the best, it's the most powerful tool you have is to know your land and understand um, what you can and cannot do in advance because that's gonna help Renee and Paul do their job. It's gonna help me help you. Um, so the more you know about your site, you know, it, you're going to understand when we tell you that, oh, this is going to be difficult, you already start to understand why those things are the way they are. But, um, you know, I didn't write the laws, Renee, Paul didn't write the laws, <laughs> you know, a lot of the stuff that we have to enforce is actually from the state and we just have to interpret it at the county level. Um, and so we try to do everything we can to get you through it. All right. Well, thanks everybody for your time. And thank you so much, Mike and Paul. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks everybody. Mike. Thanks, Conservation District. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, All Renee. Right. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.